The study of metaphysics gives us a new sense of perspective by which to deal with the world. In a very real sense, it introduces us to a new dimension of reality. The fact is that when we get into the study of metaphysics, humanly there's a tendency to get on our charger like Don Quixote and go out and try to change the world. But one of the fundamentals that so often is overlooked is that metaphysics does not deal with changing the world. The whole principle is based upon ourselves. It is not the world that we're concerned about, but our thought about the world. The important key to effective living, then, is not trying to find the way to set things right and to straighten people out and to get the world to stop acting like it does. Not to set things right, but to see them rightly. Right seeing is the fundamental essence of truth. Metaphysics is a technique in right seeing, helping you to see things from a particular perspective, as Emerson would say, from the highest possible point of view. And all this is wrapped up in what we're calling today the art of thinking. It seems to me that the greatest neglect in education today, and uh, it's not my intent to, to nitpick about the educators because certainly people here in this profession are doing a tremendous work helping people in a tremendous way, but I think there has been a neglect that has set into modern education. It's very subtle. Unless we think we're pointing at one particular movement, we'll say that the same problem is found in the study of metaphysics, another kind of education. It's a failure in the instruction in the art of thinking. In other words, the whole thought process is so often simply taken for granted. We're thinking creatures, and so we think. And we're told what to think. And we're exposed to all sorts of levels of learning, and we're supposed to think about them and to memorize them and to report them back much as we've heard them. It is rare in education that we're introduced to the process of how to think. The mind is dealt with, for the most part, as a fact collector and a word dispenser. And this is so true in the study of metaphysics. That we're told that we're thinking creatures, we're mental beings, and therefore the important thing is you must think this, you must think that, you must think the other. So we're constantly building in and programming our mind with affirmations and techniques and treatments and so forth, and learning to verbally repeat them and now picture them in the words that we express. Thought for the average person is a reflex process. In other words, things happen and we react in thought. We become worried, we become fearful, we become concerned and anxious, or on the other hand, we become happy and inspired. And we assume, and this assumption is almost universally prevalent among people, we assume that the thoughts that we think are produced by the circumstances that we experience. And that mind is something that we hold within our skull by which we can deal with the world out there. Things happen and we react, we think, and we say, well, of course I'm upset. You'd be upset too if you had the same experiences. Life is a continuous reaction to outside stimuli to the average person. So one may be happy or sad or life has meaning or is meaningless by evidence of what happens to us from day to day. We may even sometimes check the weather or consult the stock market returns, or even go to a doctor to see how we feel. Ask the average person, how do you feel today? I don't know. I have to wait till I get down to the office to see how the, what kind of a mood the boss is in. And then I'll know how I feel. But experiences do not cause thoughts. Emphasize, experiences do not cause thoughts. Someone may do something to you. And he may give you a perfect opportunity to be upset if you want to be upset. But if you don't want to be upset, you needn't be upset, you see. The incident happens. There's no use denying it. It's not saying that he didn't say it or it didn't happen or they, they're not doing these things in the world out there. They're happened. They've happened. And it becomes history once it's happened. But as far as your experience is concerned, 
the incident is completely external. It's always on the outside. What happens in your mind happens as a result of your attitudes and your feelings and your habit patterns. Your mind is your domain. Now, this is fundamental, and these words are easy to express, but it's so important to get this into our consciousness. You think what you want to think, or you think what you have habitually thought by a certain tendency of habit patterns. Your thoughts are your reactions to the incident, always. The incident did not make the thought. It is your mind, and you have been thinking and reacting in thought according to the level of your consciousness. I was talking to a young chap in a, in a hotel one day. He was one of the hotel clerks. There was a lot of people coming in for a uh, convention, and they were harassed, and people were there early, and other people were staying late, and, you know, the usual thing that happens in hotels. And one of them was saying, Boy, I sure have problems tonight. And one could feel sorry for him. But I talked to one of the other clerks a little later, and he had an entirely different thought. He said, You know, people sure have problems tonight. Both of them dealing with the same experience, one of them dealing with what I call horizontal thought, the other dealing with vertical thought. I have problems, people have problems, but I have problems because of the way I'm reacting to people problems. But if I keep myself in perfect peace, then I'm simply concerned that people have problems, but they're on the outside, then I can handle them, then I can deal with them. When was the last time you said, he makes me so mad, or that just tees me off? And, of course, this is not correct at all. No one ever makes you mad. No one ever gets you upset. As I say often, you are upset because you're upsetable. You're angry because you have an anger consciousness that is touched like a little red button that causes it to blow up within yourself, but the anger is already within, you see. So you react in thinking to the level, to, according to the level of your attitudes, according to your consciousness. So the thing that happens then is we allow our mental mastery to go by default. Some of us are completely unaware of the fact that we have the power to control the kind of thoughts that run rampant in our minds. That's the thing that's fundamental in this study of truth, to realize that it is your mind. Therefore, you have to ask yourself the question from time to time. When you find yourself terribly upset or concerned or anxious or worried about something that's happened, Take a good look in yourself and ask yourself this one question, not why do they do this, why is the world falling apart, why do we have so many problems in life, but why do I allow people or experiences or things to determine how I'm going to think or feel or act? This I can do something about. In the same way we tend to succumb to race beliefs, to group psychology, to subliminal suggestion, we're susceptible to the programming of mass media that is designed especially to control and influence thought simply because we've allowed ourselves to react. This is why mass media is so successful. Because of this pattern of reactive thinking, we are led into a life that is not really our own at all. We don't live our lives. We live lives that are conditioned by outside stimuli. But that's because we refuse to accept the responsibility for our own thoughts. So the very first step in this process that we're calling the art of thinking, is to know that no matter what happens in your world, no matter what happens out there, no matter what you read in the papers, no matter what is taking place around you or to you, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be unhappy. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be fearful. You can choose to think positively or creatively if that's the way you want. You can become the master instead of the slave. Oh, it's not easy. Now, let's not kid ourselves. It's not easy to take possession of our mind, to change from being a reflex thinker to a creative thinker. It takes a lot of discipline and will and commitment because we've been thinking in the other way so long. But we can do so. It's not easy to think happiness when you're unhappy because your unhappiness is busy manufacturing more unhappy thoughts. Tagore comments on this. He says, the slave is busy making whips for his master. So we're busy manufacturing negative thoughts to fulfill the negative state of consciousness. And it goes round and round. It's a vicious cycle. So in a very real sense, it could be said, if someone asks you what your occupation is, if you want to be realistic about it, you could say, I'm a manufacturer. Because I'm always manufacturing the kind of things that happen in my life according to my consciousness. You see, we do this unthinkingly. 
like the little woman who is the classic story of the woman who was sitting commiserating over a lot of her problems, and she had a lot of problems. She was talking about them, almost counting them one by one like rosary beads. One of her friends trying to console her said, oh, come on now, things are not that bad. After all, you should try to be positive. And she said classically, I don't see it that way. It seems to me when the Lord sends me tribulations, it's my duty to tribulate. <laughs> Some people seem to feel that you should be unhappy, that you should be negative. If you walk into an office someday smiling and singing and whistling, people say, what do you have to be so happy about? But as I say so often, you don't have to have anything to be happy about ever. You can be happy simply because you want to be happy. Abraham Lincoln once said, a man is about as happy as he makes up his mind to be. This is the key to the positive life. This is the key to positive thinking. It's not filling your mind with a lot of happy platitudes, but it's simply determining that you have control and you can think the kind of thoughts that you want to think and making the commitment at the beginning of the day and regularly through the day that you're not going to allow people or conditions or circumstances to decide how you're going to think or feel. Just watch the average person read the newspaper. Watch him on a subway sometime. Sometimes you wonder what are you going to do to preoccupy your thoughts on these long subway rides. Be analytical. Watch somebody reading the paper. You read, you read a few of the lines, you go, Oh, terrible. And there are a lot of things to tut-tut about, actually, you know, because the, and, uh, the newspapers like the New York Post have really made tremendous hay on, on the process that people like to tut-tut. So the point is, that person is simply shoring up in consciousness the fact that he fully believes that it's a terrible world, that everything's going to pot, and so he reads all the things that says, see, I told you, I told you, I told you. And he's upset because he's upsetable. He's upsetable before he reads the paper. Now, if he wants to make any changes, either changes in the world or changes in himself, he has to begin to ask himself some serious questions. Why do I allow the New York Post or the New York Times or the Daily News? Let's cover all the waterfront so it won't be hard. <laughs> Why do we allow these things, these outside stimuli, to determine how I'm going to think? Why do we allow listening to the radio or the television to get me upset? Do I want to be upset? But you've got to be realistic, a person will say. After all, things are in the world, and what are you going to do about them? Fact is, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. You can say, as the hotel clerks did, one of them said, I have terrible problems, and the other one says, people have terrible problems. In the one case, the person is totally destroyed by the problems of people. In the other case, the person is there ready to help if he needs to help, but he keeps himself oblivious from it. He's objective, and thus he can serve without being destroyed within himself. And this is a very important realization. And I say this to a person who wants to be a good positive truth student, don't stop reading the paper, certainly, don't stop listening to the news, unless you find that you do not have as yet the developed capacity to, to keep the news on the outside. If you don't, then you better not read the news for a while until you keep yourself in perfect peace and develop the capacity to control your own thoughts. Then you can read the news and listen to the news and see what's going on in the world, saying that the world has problems today. But not I have problems, the world has problems. Then suddenly you, you're in a state of consciousness where you can be a, a creative asset to the world, but at least you're not going to be destroyed by it.